our first presentation here is actually going to pick up exactly where we left off yesterday. Um, I'm, I'm semi-tempted to sort of review everything that we've learned up to this point, but I'm going, to, I'm going to resist that temptation and just remind us of what we sort of ended with last night. We were asking the question, um, why do innocent children suffer? And, and we made the, the point, not just innocent children, but why does anyone suffer? Why is there not only suffering in the world, but so much suffering in the world? We made the point that while we do not have every answer to every possible I mean, some of the situations that you hear about are so discouraging, so terrible, so, so heartbreaking that it's impossible to give anything like an actual explanation. But while we cannot give an actual data-based explanation, we do know that the answer lies certainly within the fact that, that God himself is not distant from our suffering, he is not aloof from our pain, but according to what we learned yesterday, God is with us in our suffering, he is with us in our pain. Now, I just want to say one little word on that, a bit of an extension about what we talked about last night, because it's going to segue really nicely into what we're going to talk about today, which is, will there ever be justice on earth? And uh, this is a great question. Frankly, it's a question that, that most people who are observing the world want to know. I mean, even the situations that we're in right now with what's happening on the global scene with Syria and other things, it's, it's very difficult to even have a, a sense of what is the right thing in this? Is this the right thing? Is this the right thing? Or is something else entirely different the right thing? And because we live in a world that is so often devoid of justice, it's creating an increasing welling within us for real justice, not the artificial, political, sort of temporary kinds of justice solutions that we get, but real justice, a real longing for a society and a culture and a world in which justice is not just the exception, but the, the rule. And uh, I believe that Jesus is the center of all possible hope for justice that we could ever have on this earth and the earth to come. And let me just sort of try and illustrate that. Um, C.S. Lewis, the, the cr Christian scholar and author and philosopher, makes a very interesting point. Now this is dealing with the issue of suffering, but it's going to tie in with justice. He basically says, and I'll paraphrase here, imagine that you're in a, a dentist's waiting room. Are there any dentists here? Okay, um, I'm sorry if I don't want to offend any dentists, but uh, imagine that you're in the waiting room of a dentist and you have a, ah, ah, your tooth is bothering, you have a toothache, okay? And so you can just imagine you're sitting there in the waiting room and you have a toothache and we'll say that the value of that toothache is X. Whatever the pain that you are experiencing is X pain, right? And let's say it's a really, really bad toothache, so it's X is worth a lot of pain. Maybe on a scale of 1 to 10, it's like an 8 and a half or a 9. So oh, oh, I just need to see the dentist. Okay. Now, Lewis's point's a very interesting one. He says, now imagine that there's somebody else also sitting in the um, waiting room wanting to see the dentist because they, ah, they also have a toothache. Okay. Now, don't miss this. A very subtle but very significant point. He says, you might say that the total pain in the waiting room is 2x, right? Because you have, you're sitting there with, ah, pain x, and somebody else is sitting there, ah, also with pain x. And you can even say there's four or five or six people all sitting there with a pain, uh, toothache pain. You could say the total pain in the room, mathematically, if we were going to make a mathematical equation for it, we would say it's 2x if there's two people, or three or four or five x. So far, so good. But here's the point. No one person is experiencing anything more than X. Right? You could say the sum total of pain in the room is 2X, 3X, 4X, but no individual person is experiencing more pain than they can experience. Now, the brilliant part about this is that God has built us with the capacity to engage only so much pain, only so much suffering, only so much hurt. And so when we have reached the sum total of what a, one human being can feel in terms of pain or suffering or, or despair, that's a terrible thing, but it's what only one person can suffer. Adding a hundred or a thousand or even a million sufferers to that does not increase the pain that any one person can feel with one exception. According to Scripture, and this is remarkable, according to Scripture, and you can go look at Isaiah 53 and there are other passages, Jesus as both man and God, 
That's one of the things that we've been talking about is the center theme of Scripture. The, 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 the fulcrum upon which Scripture hinges is that God, in keeping covenant with man, became a man himself. And so Jesus possesses a supernatural ability to experience suffering. His shoulders are infinitely broad, unlike, say, my shoulders or your shoulders, which can only bear up under so much pain, so much suffering, so much trauma, that eventually the physical system just gives out. The human body can only endure so much, which is why terrible and torturous and demonic men throughout ages have invented pain that is the most protracted, the most terrible, that keeps you alive for as long as possible before you die. So, for example, like crucifixion. The purpose of crucifixion was to cause as much physical pain, but in increments slow enough and long enough and intervals protracted enough that you suffered the longest, ultimately dying of despair and asphyxiation. But Jesus didn't die a physical death. Jesus died a much more terrible, much more horrific death. Jesus died what the Bible actually calls the second death, and I'm not going to get into that here, but the point is this. Where you and I can experience only our own pain, only our own, ah, that toothache is hurting. You'll never feel someone else's toothache. You will never feel someone else's heartbreak. You can only feel what you are capable of feeling. Now, of course, you can empathize, you can sympathize, but still, it's you that's feeling it if you're empathizing with another person. But God in flesh was able to feel everyone's pain, everyone's hurt, everyone's heartbreak, everyone's despair. And that's exactly what it says in Isaiah 53 when describing the coming Messiah. He has borne our griefs, our pains. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And so here in Christ, we see both God and man able to endure not just his own pain, not just his own suffering, not just his own heartbreak from sin, but he felt it for all humanity. The depth, the quantity, and the quality of his suffering is perfectly incalculable. In fact, it's infinite. His ability to suffer is infinite because he is God, and, and sin and, and pain and death are infinitely painful to him, much more so than you or I. We are calloused to sin. We are calloused to pain. We are calloused to these things. But God, being perfectly holy, perfectly pure, and perfectly loving, His, his recoiling from sin, His hatred and revulsion for self-centeredness, His capacity for suffering is infinitely greater than yours or mine. And so what we see in Christ on the cross, in many ways, is the hinge to the question of justice. Here is someone who is actually capable of understanding and apprehending what real suffering is and what real pain is. And so when he sees the, the woman who's been abused or when he sees the country that's been racked by genocide or when he sees the, the country that's, that's suffering from a lack of food and other resources, Jesus can empathize not just with every individual situation because he really was a human being. Jesus can empathize with all situations and on the cross event, he took it upon himself. Okay, with that sort of in mind, I want to talk to you today about how that justice that, that, that the Messiah longs to achieve, that he longs to bring to the earth, how will it happen and will it ever happen on this earth? And that's the title of our presentation. Jesus is at the center of this, uh, Jesus is at the center of all scripture. We've made that point repeatedly here. But particularly when we start talking about issues of suffering and pain and justice and righteousness on earth, Jesus is right at the center of it, his person and his crucifixion. Will there ever be justice on earth is uh, what we want to talk about now. And I want to start by sort of introducing you to a story, a story that's so amazing, so compelling. Um, actually, I think I've got a quotation before I actually get right into that story here. Um, can you help me out there, guys? There we go. Great. Here's a really nice uh, quotation, one that I just love in my heart of hearts um, from an evangelical theologian named Gregory Boyd. He writes, Every exorcism and every healing... Two activities that most characterize Jesus' ministry marked an advance. Marked a what? An advance. So here's Jesus, and he's casting out demons here, and he's healing people here. He's going into towns and villages. In fact, many scholars have noted that he spent more time healing and, and, and restoring physically than he did actually preaching. And so here what, what, what Boyd says is every exorcism and every healing, activities that, the two activities that most characterize Jesus' ministry, marked an advance toward establishing the what? Kingdom of God over and against the kingdom of Satan. 
Consequently, in contrast with the view that would suggest that disease and demonization somehow serve a divine purpose, Jesus never treated such phenomenon as anything other than the work of the enemy. He consistently treated diseased and demonized people as, what are those next three words there? As casualties of war. Furthermore, rather than accepting their circumstances as somehow mysteriously fitting into God's sovereign plan, no. Jesus revolted against them as something that God did not and, and that God did not will and something that ought to be vanquished by God's power. This is Gregory Boyd in his book, Satan and the Problem of Evil. Now don't miss that. What we see in much of the New Testament is Jesus establishing justice on earth. But he's doing it not by a political uh, process. He's doing it not by lobbying Congress, as it were, or petitioning Caesar or trying to establish just laws. And by the way, there is a place for that. But what Jesus was doing is in one case at a time, one individual at a time, he's, he's bringing the kingdom of God into, into direct conflict with the kingdom of the enemy, the kingdom of Satan. We mentioned that just briefly in our last presentation when we talked about the field of wheat. Jesus said that a man planted wheat, but all of a sudden what came to be seen among the wheat? What was it? There was weeds, and when Jesus was questioned about this, this is in Matthew chapter 13, hey, where did the weeds come from? What was his response? I mean, it was, a, it was an unequivocal response. It was an unmistakable response. What did he say? Five words. An enemy has done this. How much responsibility did Jesus take for the presence and the existence of these weeds? None. An enemy has done this. He laid all of the responsibility somewhere else. And so what we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is this marvelous advance. And I think uh, Dr. Boyd uses exactly the right word here. This advance where the kingdom of Christ is coming into direct conflict, direct combat with the kingdom of Satan, and in one situation, one diseased person healed, one uh, a person living a life of sin redeemed, one demonized person exercised. As Jesus here is reclaiming individuals one person at a time, he is establishing the kingdom of God on earth, and he's bringing justice. He's bringing justice to that situation, to that situation, to that situation, to that person, to that person, to that home, to that home. In fact, let me just show you one instance of this. It's in Luke chapter 13. It's one of the most remarkable instances in all of the gospel accounts. And uh, it's remarkable for a number of reasons, one of which is Jesus is finding himself here in direct confrontation, not just with demonic powers, but actually, this is astonishing, with the religious leaders of his day who, to some degree, are sympathetic, whether they themselves know it, with the demonic powers. And so in Luke chapter 13, verse 10, look at this story. I mean, what an amazing story. It says, now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, that was his custom. Verse 11. And behold, there was a woman there who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Right? Verse 12. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and he said, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. There's that personal touch. I love that. And immediately she was what? She was, she was made straight and she thanked God. She glorified God. Right, so Jesus here, not in a show, an act of showmanship, not in an act of miraculous pulling the rabbit out of the hat. No, Jesus' heart is genuinely pained and, and hurt as he sees this woman in this deformed and, and, and uh, in, this, in this diseased condition. And so he calls her to himself and he says, woman, you're loosed from your infirmity. And if, if we have the rest of Jesus' teachings, how he did this was not, a, again, an act of showmanship in some sort of performance. It was often done on the sly, very quietly and very, tell no man. And so here in the synagogue, Jesus' heart is so moved that he heals this woman. She stands up straight. But this is a remarkable thing that's happened, so attention is called to it. Verse 14, but the ruler of the synagogue, who must have noticed what had happened, answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath. Then the Lord answered him and said, hypocrite, which is just another way of saying, you're, you're an actor, you're a performer, are you kidding? You're a religious person? Hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? Now look at verse 16, here's the critical phrase. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound... Think of it, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Now hold on to those four words. Whom Satan has bound. 
If you take those four words and you put them in juxtaposition with the five words that we encountered earlier, an enemy has done this, we have a basic biblical picture in nine words of why there is injustice, why there is suffering, and why there is pain on earth. God takes Jesus rather takes no responsibility for the existence of the weeds in the garden. Jesus takes no responsibility for the woman's infirmed condition, but he does take full responsibility for her regenerate condition. And his response in two phrases is, an enemy has done this, whom Satan has bound. And it is right here, and this is Boyd's amazing point, and it's, the, it's, it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John's point as well, that Jesus is going about village by village, city by city, town by town, family by family, household by household, and he is establishing forgiveness and righteousness and justice on an individual basis. He is literally, as it were, reclaiming God's territory. And this is, this is what we see in much of the New Testament, is this, this radical conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness, coming into direct conflict. But at every turn, in Jesus' case, the kingdom of God is victorious. Justice is established. Healing is brought. And the Messiah is at the center of it all. He will take that justice, just to sort of bring the earlier point that we were making full circle, he will take that justice and that longing for healing and righteousness to such a degree that he himself at the cross will eventually bear all of the world's infirmities, all of its rebellions, all of its sin on his infinitely broad shoulders and he will die a death that he does not deserve and which we cannot understand. He will experience a depth of suffering that is perfectly inexplicable, and it's here. While we may not have the answer to every circumstance, every situation, we can point to any suffering person who's experiencing, ah, pain X, whatever that is, and we can say, God understands your pain. God, he knows exactly what it's like because he did not remain aloof, you know, safely ensconced in the, in the uh, halls of heaven looking down on our loathing and pitying us from afar. Oh, no, 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 no. The story of the New Testament is that God is with us. God is in the midst of us. And in fact, even more to the point, God is us. He becomes one of us to experience our experience, to live our life and to feel the depth of, of our own pain and suffering. Well, maybe more than um, many stories is this particular story that I've come across recently, um, and it's the story of the slave ship La Amistad. And uh, it's, it's a, a terrible story, and in 1839, La Amistad sailed, it was a slave ship, with about 53 slaves, I think 53 or 54 slaves, according to the ship's manifest on board, and they sailed from Havana, Cuba. Now, let me just give you a little bit of background here. At this particular time, and it was a terrible dark time in, in Earth's history um, with regards to slavery, <clears throat> in this particular time, you could buy and sell slaves as property, and it's just astonishing to think that people thought you could actually do that with human beings, but, but that's, we're not going to get into that right now for our purposes. Um, but only if those slaves had been born on a plantation, right? In other words, if a slave family or a child or whatever had been born on a plantation, they were considered sort of slaves and they could be bought and sold, etc. It was illegal at this time to go, say, to Western Africa, which was the primary area from which slaves were gathered, and just go kidnap people randomly from their villages and take them and then put them into the slave trade. And so La Amistad becomes a very interesting uh, case because it was claimed by the slave handlers and by the owners of the slaves that in fact all of these slaves had been born in Havana, Cuba and now they were being transported to some place. Um, when in fact actually a very interesting thing happened. A man by the name of Joseph Sinke led a rebellion and a revolt against the slave handlers on the ship and the slaves eventually got free from their shackles, free from their, from their confinement and they killed all of the slave handlers on board, like a dozen of them, and they left two alive. They left the captain and the navigator alive and they said, take us back to our home. Now their home wasn't Havana, Cuba. They had not been born there. They had been illegally obtained from the west coast of Africa and though there was a huge language barrier there, the two slave handlers being uh, Portuguese uh, that were, remained alive and the, 
the, the West Africans un, completely unable to speak their language. They just basically pointed to the direction of where the, the sun was rising and said, you take us there. We know our home is that direction. You take us. Well, the navigator and the captain were, of course, afraid. All of their companions had been killed, and they were now on board with these 53 or 54 slaves. And uh, what they did do was, was rather tricky. Rather than sailing east toward Africa, they began to sail north, but they stayed far enough off the coast of the United States that the United States couldn't be seen. So s sort of sailing up the coast, and, and over time, it didn't take very long for the slaves and others to figure out, hey, we're not going the right direction. But eventually what ends up happening is a remarkable story. It becomes one of the, the most amazing stories in the history of the United States Supreme Court. In, in, uh, later in 1839, the ship actually comes ashore in Long Island, New York. And uh, it was, the ship was seen, uh, you know, this uh, Portuguese, you know, slave ship was seen by two U.S. naval vessels, and they sailed out, and they, you know, what is this? And they find, you know, a Portuguese captain, a Portuguese navigator, and then a bunch of African slaves on board who, you know, can't communicate, can't talk, etc. And so they, they basically steer them into harbor. Okay, come with us into harbor. Well, the slaves are, are arrived. They can't speak. They can't communicate. And so the United States uh, government there in, uh, in New York uh, they didn't know what to do, and so they, they put them into, into a jail. They put them into prison. Well, right here is where a very interesting thing happens. There's lots of different claims on the, this property of the slaves. The Portuguese are saying, no, these are our slaves. They rightfully belong to us. Even the United States naval ships that located them said, no, based on marine law, if we find them, then they're ours. And then the United States government said, no, there's, we have a claim on them. And then there were abolitionists that were saying, no, these people should be set free. So you had these sort of, you know, multifaceted claims on these people. And here, just imagine how unusual this would have been. You know, 53 slaves fresh from the West African coast have just landed in Long Island, New York. And what do we do with these people? We can't talk the language. We don't really know where they're from. Huge communication barrier. And uh, Steven Spielberg actually made a movie about this called, um, named after the name of the ship, La Amistad, which fascinatingly means friendship. And um, as, the sort of, as the sort of court case begins to build, particularly in the movie, you, you just have this growing sense of frustration and injustice at what's happening. It's, you, you, just, you just almost want to yell at the, at the television or you want to yell at the historical circumstance and say, is there not any human being here who understands the basic principles of justice? I mean, can nobody see what the right thing to do is in this circumstance? No, but the United States court has to grind through its, you know, uh, uh, procedures. And, and of course, all of the Africans are sitting there in court. They don't understand what's taking place. They don't understand the language. All they know is that they continue to be in shackles when they just want to be back in their homeland. Well, in one particular scene in the movie, and the movie was, was shot by Spielberg to be purposefully very historically accurate, in one particular scene that just really in many ways is the climax of the sense of frustration at injustice, the slaves are sitting in the courtroom and the proceedings are going on with the different claims being made. Very interestingly, this case will eventually make it to the United States Supreme Court. But at this point, it's just being tried in a local court there in New York. And one of the, the slave, one of the slaves, in fact, I think it was Joseph Sinke who had led the revolt in the first place, he's been listening to enough English speaking and he's been sitting in on enough of these courtrooms, that he, courtroom days, that he's beginning to at least get the basics, the rudiments of the English language. And he, he, he apprehends that what they're after is freedom. Right, he gets that word. That's the thing. That's the word, freedom. And so here he is shackled in the courtroom with all of his other uh, fellow slaves. And he stands up in the middle of the proceedings and he begins to say, give us free. Give us free. Here's the one voice of reason in the whole courtroom. The one voice that is actually crying out for justice, crying out for righteousness, for what should be done in this situation. But of course, he's you'll be held in contempt of court, hush down, hush down. But he, he just he doesn't understand what's being said to him. All he knows, he's in shackles. He wants to be back in his home. He was illegally and wrongfully taken. Give us free. Well, he, he's not given his freedom. And uh, the court case sort of climbs its way up until it finally, in 1841, makes its way to the United States Supreme Court. Again, one of the most unusual court cases ever tried by the U.S. Supreme Court. And none other than John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States of America, and the son of John Adams, tries the case. 
try, he actually takes the case of the slaves, and you can actually go read uh, at least uh, uh, some of the manuscript of what he said in, that, in his presentation before the Supreme Court, and it's beautiful. It is profoundly beautiful. It's the voice of reason. It's the voice of common sense. It's the voice of freedom. It's the voice of liberty. Frankly, it's the voice of Scripture. It's God's own voice, the thing that God would say. And he, he essentially says it's not right. It's, it's not appropriate for one human being to control another human being, to, to, to manipulate and to coerce and to sell. A, no! These people need to be given their freedom. They need to be sent back. It was basically proved. Uh, by the ship's manifest, that they were not born in Havana, Cuba, that those were illegitimate uh, records that had been manufactured to make the transaction look legal. Whether it was legal, it was never ethical at all. But the point is, is that it's shown to be an illegal transaction. John Quincy Adams and the slaves win the case, and they're eventually returned. But after a long, painful process that's just fraught with, with delay after obstacle, after injustice, after injustice, after injustice. And this is simply one instance, and I'll talk about another here in just a moment, in which it seems like most of us as, as, as ordinary human beings can just look at that and say, the right thing is so clearly obvious. The just thing, the righteous thing, the godly thing, the virtuous thing is so obvious. But if it's so obvious to so many of us, why is there so little justice on earth? And why do we find ourselves consistently frustrated with the level of injustice on earth, both national and international? God did not make us to control or be controlled. He made us to communicate, to connect, and to create. When in the Garden of Eden there, God said, let us make man in our image and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as a God of, what is this everyone? A God of love, who is himself a relational being. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made Adam and Eve and said to them, make still others. He as a relational entity made other relational entities, uh, that is to say the family. As a family, he made a family in his image. And I just want to pause right here and say something. It's not just any ordinary relationship that God has amongst himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a covenantal relationship. Now, this is actually very, very important. And in our opening presentation, we asked the question, what is the Bible? And we sort of walked through the seven chapters of the Bible from pre-creation to creation to fall to covenant to church, uh, covenant to Messiah to church, and finally to re recreation. But right at the center of those six chapters, three on this side, three on this side, is the idea of covenant. The whole, the whole narrative of Scripture is built around the idea of covenant. Now, there's good reason for that because God in his nature is a covenantal relationship. I want to say that again. All of scripture is based around the idea of covenant, mutual agreement, because God is himself a covenant relationship. The relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is one in which their roles are not identical, but they're complementary. Right? The, the son has a role, and his role is not the father's role or the spirit's role. The spirit has a role within this covenantal relationship, but his role is neither the father's nor the son's. And the father has a role, but his role is not precisely identical to the son's or the father's. Their roles are all complementary. Their identities are all consistent, but each one of them has to be true to the covenant in order for the whole to work. By the way, this is very much like a marriage. You might have picked up on that, of course. A marriage is a covenantal relationship where the man has his role, the woman has her role, and the children have their role, and as long as each plays their role within the family unit, then love prevails, and goodness prevails, and virtue prevails, and happiness prevails. So far, so good, everyone? So when God, as not just any ordinary relationship, but as a covenantal relationship of respect, and mutuality, and trust, when he makes something in his image, he makes a covenant family relational unit in his image in which all are equal. All are what did I say, everyone? All are equal. Fundamental equality. By the way, this is so intuitive that the founders of this country and others knew intuitively that we hold these truths to be, what did they say? We hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, intuitively knowable. Self-evident that all men are created the funny thing is, is that even as some of them were writing those lines, they themselves had slaves. So they were self-evident intellectually, but in practice, they still had to catch up. Their praxis had to catch up with what they intellectually had consented to. But our point is this. It's, it's, 
within the marital unit, within the, the, even within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal in terms of their essential equality. Right? But essential equality does not mean that there's not a differentiation of roles within this covenantal relationship. Make sense? Right. A man is not worth more than a woman, and a woman is not worth more than a man. They are worth the same, but their roles are different. The Father is not more important to the plan of salvation than Jesus is, and Jesus is not more important than the Spirit. Each one plays a critically important role in the governing of the universe and in the actuating of the plan of salvation. Make sense? Okay, now here's the thing. When mankind is then created in the image of this relational, covenantal, trusting family unit that is God, he doesn't make man to control other men or to be controlled by other men. No, 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 no. God didn't make us to control or be controlled. He made us to create, to connect, and to communicate, which is in his own image. We don't see control and coercion and manipulation within the Godhead, and so we shouldn't be seeing it if we are truly in his image in our own societies and in our own families. But let that be a practical familial lesson for some of you parents. God has not called you to, to control in the manipulative sense or in the coercive sense your children, but to win your children, to woo your children, to attract your children. Do you hear the difference? It's very important. It's a, it's a crucially important distinction that many parents fail to understand because in our cases, we were ruled by our parents, right? You do this, well, why should I do that? Because I said so. And if we got out of line, we were maybe beaten or spanked or, or punished. And there's, I'm not saying there's no place for punishment and punitive measures in the family relation. Of course there is. But, but if we're really going to have our family units be in the image of God, they won't be built around control or coercion or manipulation, but around trust, about mutual uh, love and respect for one another, and wooing people, wooing individuals to covenant faithfulness. Do you feel that? Now... Back to La Amistad, a very interesting thing happened a number of years later. In 1868, just to sort of pick up a story here, this idea of control. In 1868, the first Vatican Council was convened by Pope Pius X on June 29th uh, of, of 1868. And uh, basically, the First Vatican Council is known for a great many things in Catholic theology and ecclesiology. But the thing it is certainly best known for was the proposition of the doctrine of papal infallibility. And uh, basically, in, in Catholic terms, the doctrine of papal infallibility essentially says this. It says that the Pope, when speaking ex cathedra, or out of the church, is immune from even the possibility of making a mistake because he's filled with the Spirit, purportedly. Now, the idea was is that when the Pope was speaking in a certain way, he literally could not make a mistake. He was immune from even the possibility of making an error. Well, very interesting. This man here has a very long name, but you might know him by a much shorter name. His, his full name is Jonathan Emmerich Edward Dahlberg Acton, right? But you may just have heard the name Lord Acton. Well, Lord Acton was an English Catholic and a historian, a politician, and a writer. And in 1870, in response to the proposition at the First Vatican Council of, of of papal infallibility, Acton and other Catholics said, no way. They resisted, as faithful Catholics, they resisted even the notion or the idea that a human being could be immune from error or from a mistake. And so Lord Acton traveled to Rome in 1870, and he threw all of his considerable weight against this, the adoption of what he perceived to be an absolutely ludicrous notion, and that was this idea that someone could be immune, even the Pope under certain circumstances. Now he, in a, later, a letter to a, a fellow scholar and friend, wrote about his objection to this doctrine, and I would imagine that if I began part of that quotation, most of you in this room could finish it. Okay? Now I'm going to give you the full context of the quotation, and now you know the context in which it was written, which was against this doctrine that a man could possess absolute power and absolute infallibility so that he was even immune from the possibility of making a mistake. This is what he wrote. I cannot accept your canon that we are to judge Pope and King unlike other men with a favorable presumption that they did no wrong. If there is any presumption, it is the other way against the holders of power increasing as the power increases. Power tends to corrupt. Now, could you finish the rest of this? Many of you could. Why don't you say it with me? And absolute power corrupts 
Absolutely. Don't miss this point. Power has a tendency to corrupt us as human beings because we're fallen. And absolute power, he says, corrupts absolutely. Now look at what he goes on to say. Great men are almost always bad men. There is no worse heresy than that the office sanctifies the holder of it. Oh, don't miss that. The idea that if you're elected to an office, whether a church office as an elder or a pastor or a deacon, that you are suddenly holy by virtue of your office. Or you're elected as a president or a congressman or a senator or even a local representative, that somehow the office makes you a different person. He says there's no greater heresy. If you were corrupt before you were elected, you'll continue to be corrupt. If you were dishonest before you were elected, you'll continue to be dishonest. Nothing about the holding of the office makes you a sanctified person. Are we together, everyone? Now, we're going to go somewhere with this that's absolutely amazing. There is no worse heresy than that the office sanctifies the holder of it. I would hang them, corrupt and murderous leaders, higher than Haman for reasons of quite obvious what? Justice. Now, don't miss... John Emmerich Edward Dahlberg Acton's point. And the point is, as you give people power and autonomy over other human beings, they tend to exercise it too often in a totalitarian and controlling way. Now, there's an amazing paradox here, and rather than waiting to the end to kind of give you the punchline, I'm going to give you the punchline right now. The amazing paradox is, this is true with, again, one glaring exception, and the exception is God. Right? You see, in general, as human beings become more and more powerful, as, entity, as, as, as beings like us become more and more powerful, the tendency for corruption increases because, hey, we have, I can do whatever I want. I'm autonomous. I, I am in perfect uh, 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 control of this country or this situation or this whatever it might be. Shh. But in God's case, he truly is in control. He truly possesses power, and not just some conventional power that's been given to him by an electoral body. He's God. But his absolute power has not caused him to become absolutely corrupt, but absolutely humble. He didn't become humble. He always was humble. Here we have a remarkable, beautiful picture that the most powerful being in the universe is the most humble, the most gracious, the most giving, and the most just. In 1971, a series of experiments were conducted in the, in the psych building of Stanford University. And these experiments have come to be so famous that they're simply called the Stanford Prison Experiments. And what took place was a man by the name of Philip Zimbardo, who was a psych professor at Stanford University. Um, basically uh, invited 24 students, Stanford University students, to participate in a, 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 um, an experiment. And over the course of a long weekend at Stanford University, they took these 24 students and then they arbitrarily decided among them, prisoner, 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 guard, prisoner, 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 guard, prisoner, 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 guard, and they just went down the list and assigned everyone arbitrary roles, not based on anything, just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You're the guards, you're the prisoners. And then they essentially just said, okay, we've got a long weekend, today's Thursday, we'll be back in, we'll be back in here on Tuesday, uh, go ahead and act appropriately. That was it, those were the instructions, act appropriately. And uh, in the words of one uh, commentator, uh, in classic understatement, the students took to their roles far beyond Zimbardo's expectations. What ends up happening is that within 48 hours, the police are called and the whole experiment has to be shut down. Why? Why was the experiment shut down? Because of a fire in the building? No. Because the guards began to manipulate, began to control and, 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 and harass, and even to some degree psychologically torture the prisoners. But they weren't prisoners, of course. They were just their fellow students. And they weren't guards, of course. They were just fellow students as well. But what had happened was, as soon as you assigned a role and you said there's no accountability, there's no liability, just, just do what you want. And you're given total autonomy, total control over another human being. Um, they began to exercise that control and exercise that power in such a way that it became torturous and terrible and demonic and, and it was amazing, and the whole experiment had to be shut down. Fascinatingly, Zimbardo later wrote a book, a book that I have in my library called, listen to the title of the book, The Lucifer Effect. Right? And I think the subtitle is How Good People Turn Bad. 
And basically, the, the fascinating thing is, is that you and I might sit there and think, man, those students have lost their mind. And Pope Pius X, what were they thinking? And those slaveholders on La Amistad, what were they thinking? And Zimbardo's point, and it's actually Scripture's point, is that the thing that makes everyone go bad, everyone possesses. If circumstances were such that you were placed in a situation where you had complete control and autonomy over another human being, chances are you would exercise it in a terrible way. Study after study after study has shown it's not just bad people that do bad things, it's ordinary people that do bad things when they're placed in, an ex in a situation where the expectation is for them to do bad things. And we had another example in 2004 with the Abu Ghraib Iraq prison scandal when individuals were basically told by their uh, superiors, their commanding officers, hey, look, extract information, intimidate, harass, and then you had otherwise normal people that began to do the most humiliating and, and, and terrible terrible uh, 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 acts to these prisoners, why? And the answer is, because they could. Because they could, because they were told to, because they were allowed to. And right here, Scripture identifies the germ of rebellion, the germ of selfishness that is implanted in the human heart of every, in, in, in every human heart. I'll just read you one particular very unflattering description of humanity by none other than the Apostle Paul. He writes in Romans chapter 3, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. I'm in verse 12. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And you might be tempted, and I might be tempted to read that and think, man, what a bunch of rotten people. Oh, who are these people? And do you know what Paul's answer is? Do you know what the answer of history is? Do you know what the answer of scientific exper uh, of, of experience is? It's you. It's me. We are fundamentally broken, and this was Acton's point. When you give people who are fundamentally broken and fundamentally selfish power over others, that power tends to corrupt, but you give someone absolute power over another human being, I mean, how do dictatorships end up? There never is a true benevolent dictatorship. They always, the Idi Amin's and the Pol Pot's and the Mao Zedong's of the world, always go spiraling down into an increasing sense of their own superiority and power. And that is true, again, in every single case with one glaring exception, and that's God himself, Amen. who has total power, who has absolute sovereignty over the universe, and yet as the most powerful being, we see him hanging on a cross, a Roman device of torture? Why? What's he doing there? What is he doing down there? He's exercising a totally different kind of power. Not a power of strength or of puissance or of might, but a power of character. The power of love. The power that doesn't win by force, but woos by attraction. Who invites us to love him, to believe in him. This marvelous thing, as we described last night, you know, God could destroy Satan just as easily as I slide that clicker across the floor. God, that's, if, it was, if it just boiled down to an issue of might, this thing is over. But what God is doing, he's wooing his rebellious creation back to him. Not by the strength of his nature, but by the beauty of his character. Yeah? And this God, as you would expect, gave a standard of conduct, a standard as to how we should use our freedom. And, and, and this standard of conduct as to how we should use our freedom is, is the law. It's the law. One of my favorite quotations from George MacDonald says this, and it's an appropriate place to do it here, being located so close to D.C. He says, it is not in the nature of politics that the best men should be elected. Because the best men do not want to govern their fellow men. Right. We want the best men to govern us, but it's not in the nature of politics that that should happen because the best of men don't want to govern their fellow men. Right? This is why, I'm just going to make a mild statement here. It's not a political statement, it's a factual statement, but it has political implications. This is why people who really understood this, like Thomas Jefferson, very perspicaciously and insightfully said things like this. The government that really governs best, does anyone know this? Governs least. 
right? The government that governs best governs least because it's not a government that's, that's governing out of coercion and manipulation and even dependency. It's a government that's, that's governing out of, hey, let's all work together for the common good, right? A government of the people, for the people, and by the people. It's a radical notion, and frankly, it's a biblical notion. The idea that, hey, if I'm generally looking out for you and you're looking out for me and, and, I'm, and we're looking out for one another and our community is looking out for, what, then we don't really need people over us to coerce us and to cajole us into going into different directions because this is the way that we will go. But the brokenness of humanity has made this virtually impossible. God has given the church a law. Now, whenever we talk about a law, he's given the world a law too. Whenever we talk about a law, instantaneously the ideas of duty and responsibility come to the forefront. But I would like to suggest to you that in fact the primary issue with God's law is not obligation but opportunity. I want to say that again. That God's primary concern in giving a law, in giving a standard of moral conduct is not an obligation, you will abide by the following precepts. No, it's not that. It's an opportunity to live the life that God has actually created you to live. And at the core of that law, and this should come as no surprise to us, is the principle of love. In fact, I'll just read you, since I'm here in Romans, I've been reading in Romans 3, the Apostle Paul. Let me just read you in Romans 13, what Paul has to say about this idea of a law. Romans 13, verse 8. He says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. He who what? He who loves has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the very fulfillment of the law. By the way, this is exactly what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 22, you can turn there on your own time. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was approached by an individual who said, hey, what's the great commandment in the law? I mean, what's the big one? Because according to Jewish rabbinical uh, counting, there's like 612 laws in the Old Testament. So it's an appropriate question to say, of the 612 or 613, I forget exactly how many it is, um, what's the most important? And Jesus said, oh, come on, this is a piece of cake, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now think about that for just a moment. What a strange commandment, right? The greatest commandment, you'd better love, right? This is why the commandments are not primarily out of obligation. They're opportunities. They're opportunities to live that divine life that God has created us to live. This is why Jesus said, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be what? Free indeed. Not free to live in harmony with the principles of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, or even with your own selfish principles. But when we are truly free, what that means, you're free to live the life that you were created to, to live. True freedom comes not just in a wanton ability to do what you want, when you want, how you want, to who you want. That's not freedom. That's actually damnation. That's bondage to your own selfish desires. True freedom comes when, when, when we are able and, and made able and redeemed for the purpose of being able to live the life that God originally created us to live, which at its most fundamental core is a life of love. It's a life of connection. It's, it's a life of meaning. I was recently asked to write an essay for a magazine, What is the Meaning of Life? Well, I thought, this is a piece of cake. I can write that essay in less than 100 words. I was given 1,500, of which I took every one. But to, to write a question on what is the meaning of life is so easy. It's to love and be loved. We know that. We know that intuitively. To love and be loved. That is the purpose of life. It's the meaning of life. It's what Paul says. Oh, all of this law thing, it's fulfilled in love. Jesus said the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love your neighbors yourself. And then he went on to say, and on these two principles, these two commands, hang the law and the prophets. So in the case of the Ten Commandments, love for God is the first four commandments. Now I want you to see those first four commandments maybe in a new way here. The first commandment, this is from Exodus chapter 20, is you shall have no other gods before me. And, and inside of that command is not merely an obligatory, an obligatory requirement, you won't have any other gods, only me. No, 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 no. What God is saying here, he's inviting us as a lover. He's inviting us as a friend. He's inviting us as a father. Give me your affections. 
give me your affections on April 4th, 1999, when I married my own wife, one of the things that the minister said to us is, do you take this woman to have and to hold? Do you take this man to have and to hold? What does that mean, to have? Well, it doesn't mean to possess in the property sense. It means to, to ha that they have your affections. That there are no other women before this woman. That there are no other men before this man. Give him, give her your undivided affections. You will have no other gods before me. Now look at the second commandment. You will not bow down to any, you know, I'm the Lord your God. You shall not bow down to any images or serve them. For I the Lord thy God. Okay, anyway, I'm not going to quote the whole commandment here. Bowing down to or serving images. What God is saying here is, that's an illegitimate use of your body. Give me your body. I gave you your body as a gift, and you use your body to honor me. Now, here's an, an even very interesting thing here. When the commands begin with, you shall not, you shall not, an actual better translation of this in the Hebrew is, you will not. It's totally different. You shall not has the issue of responsibility and duty and obligation. When you will not sounds like a promise. Right? You have been living that way, but from this day forward, you won't live that way anymore. And it creates the sense that you won't live that way anymore because you don't want to, and now you have the power to not live that way anymore. You will not have any other gods before me. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you for that promise. Right? You will not bow down to other gods or serve them. Oh, thank you for that opportunity to be free from the bondage of idolatry and, and uh, sl slavery to idols. The, the third one is you will not take the Lord's name in vain. And with what is it that we take the name of God in vain? It's our mouth saying one thing and doing another, taking God's name in vain. And so God says here, give me your mouth, give me your words. In the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What is God asking for here? The Sabbath is all about time. In fact, it's the most unusual commandment. You just read through the Ten Commandments and say, which one of these is kind of doing its own thing here? It's clearly the Sabbath. I mean, first of all, it's much longer. Second of all, it has tons of little details. We're going to talk about the Sabbath this afternoon in a, for what will be for many of you, a whole new way, or at least it's new to me. And um, what God is asking for here is our time. Now, this is very interesting. The first commandment, God says, give me your affections. The second commandment, God says, give me your body. The third commandment, God says, give me your words and thoughts. And the fourth commandment, God says, give me your time. Beloved, that's relational language. For those of you that have a husband or a wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, if, if you don't give any of those four things to your significant other, you're having a relational breakdown, right? That is, the, that is the foundation, those four things of which any relationship is built upon, right? If your spouse doesn't have your genuine affections or if you sense that you don't have the affections of your spouse, you're going to not have relational health. You're going to have relational dysfunction, true or false, of course. And if, if, if you are, oh, I love you so much, sweetie, but my body is going to be in Mississippi while your body is in California. How's that going to work out? By the way, any husband or wife who would want to be away from their spouse's body, I don't know. I got issues with that. Um, I kind of want to be as close to my wife's body as often, probably a little more often than she likes, should the truth be told. <laughs> did I really just say that? I think I did. <laughs> anyway, that's what you get with me. I'm going to tell you what it is as it is. So, so, uh, God here is saying, give, give your, your, I'm having really trouble recovering from that one. Okay. Okay, I got to shake it up. Let me get a drink of water. My wife is probably just somewhere cowering in fear right now. Ready to absolutely slay me. Okay. Here we go. You give your, you give your partner your affections. You give your partner your body. You give your partner your words. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you. And I like you. I'm just never going to tell you. No, it's not going to work. You give your words. You, oh, you look good today, sweetheart. Oh, that looks really nice on you. You are beautiful. I am, many daughter, daughters have fared virtuously, but thou excellest them all. You know, any little <laughs> cute compliment that you can come up with, you know, words. Am I right, ladies? Yeah. Right. How many of you have read Gary Chapman's book, The uh, Five Love Languages? It's a great one. It's a great one. And uh, one of my favorite things there is words of affirmation. And it's amazing. As you ask the men, you know, hey, what's your love language? Men are like, uh, words of affirmation and physical touch. Yeah. <laughs> no brainer. And then you ask the ladies, you know, what are, what's your love language? And it's usually um, words of, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, quality time and acts of service. <laughs> Mow the lawn and spend some time with the family, right? So anyway, <laughs> I could have written Gary Chapman's book in about 100 words or less. But anyway, that's beside the point. 
And then finally, all relationships are built around time. Right? Let's spend real time together. I read an article several years ago that was a great one for me to read as a father and as a husband, and the article was called The Myth of Quality Time. And the article basically said there is no such thing as quality time. It's just quantity, man. You know, your kids don't, at the end of the day, your kids aren't going to care with, if they're at Disneyland or if they're playing in a mud puddle down at the end of the road. Your kids just need your time. They need to be with you. Your, your, your spouse, you know, it's one thing for you to take, you know, a, a week-long vacation to Hawaii and have a great time. Fine, but far more important than those little, you know, itinerant, oh, and we'll do one vacation a week where we spend time together, is the ongoing, let's take a walk together. Let's spend, am I right, ladies? Let's spend time together. And, and what God is saying here is, I have built you this way. You see, true freedom and true justice comes when we live a life in harmony with the principle of love because God is love. And right in the Ten Commandments, which many of us hear, the Ten Commandments <laughs> commanded from Sinai in a sonorous voice, you will do this and you'll be happy. <laughs> no! What God is saying is, give me your affections. Give me your body. Give me your words and thoughts and give me your time and you will be happier for it. Your life will be better. True freedom will come not from obeying someone who's more powerful from, than you, but actually by giving the opportunity to obey someone who has wooed you to himself by his beautiful character. The Christian life, I want to say, is not a list of obligations. It's, it's the glory of opportunity. It's not a list of do's and don't do's. It's the opportunity to live the life that God created you to live. A life of other-centeredness, a life of service, a life of love, a life of selflessness. We are happiest when we are ministering to others. We are happiest when our life is not built around us. Will there ever be justice on earth? The answer is yes. And that justice will proceed from the Messiah. But it will not come to this earth wholesale, universally, corporately. It will come to the earth made new when righteousness rains down. And when, oh, one of my favorite passages, you can go read it, is Isaiah 42. In fact, let me just do a quick speed reading course. Look at this as we wrap this up. Man, Isaiah 42, righteousness and justice will come, but watch, it all comes from the Messiah. Isaiah 42, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastland shall wait for his law. Thus says the Lord who created the heavens and who stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and the spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep you. I will give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. God says, my Messiah, my son Jesus, will establish justice on earth. By the way, he is the one uniquely qualified to do so because he has felt our pain. He has endured our suffering. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And so he knows not only what it is like to rule as sovereign God over the universe, but he knows what it's like to be nailed to a tree. Who better to bring justice to the earth than the one who possesses absolute power but doesn't lord it over his subjects to coerce and even to obligate, but to call, to invite, to woo, not on the strength of his nature, but on the beauty of his character.